Nigel Mansell had a Formula One career that was a constant mix of melodrama, controversy and supreme courage and determination. In 1992, he became Britain's first Formula One world champion in 16 years and still holds the record for most Grand Prix victories by any British driver. He had his critics, but they were outnumbered by tens of thousands of fans who recognised a man who was breathing new life into Grand Prix motor racing. We've come to the sunny island of Jersey to meet a true legend of Formula One. Hey Nigel. Good morning, Steve. It's great to see you. How great are to see you. What Welcome. A gorgeous day, and thanks for inviting us here to uh, to Jersey. You know how to pick a stunning location. Well, it's this not too is bad, is it? Absolutely yeah. sensational. No, it's a little bit of heaven. Jersey is a wonderful island, and uh, people are great here, and it's just so fantastic. When you look back to those early years, you know, back end of the 70s and the sacrifices that you made. You, you must be amazed that you got this far. I think the worst uh, time I had was when I broke my neck in 1977 at Brands Hatch. To be told at that time that I'd never walk again. Uh, uh, I don't even want to remember it, to be honest, mm. but uh, fortunately, many, many weeks later and months later, I was back in a car and uh, obviously getting the job done. And a short time after that came the breakthrough into Formula One. That's what we want to talk about with you. We want to reflect on some of the great moments, the great races, and uh, and also perhaps put the record straight on a few things as well. Well, you never know, Steve. Um, you'll, you'll be asking me some very difficult questions, well, I'm, I'm sure. I am looking forward to this. <laughs> so, Nigel, the Formula One year started um, in the best possible way for you, with the strongest of allies in, in Colin Chapman. When did you first make contact with Colin and... Uh, make the Lotus connection? Uh, basically back in 1978, a couple of years before he gave me my first opportunity. Um, worked for him as an engineer. I progressed from there then to obviously uh, having some testing then a year or so after and then getting uh, the first drive in 1980. First race that uh, might stand out for you certainly sort of stands out in the history books, uh, Zolder uh, and your first podium but, it, it, but the race day began with you sitting on the grid behind a, a, an awful accident which, in, which involved Ricardo Patrese's mechanic. I watched the whole thing in front of me, so I was just a couple back and the mechanic jumped over the wall um, and obviously tried to push or start the car, uh, which was a rather foolish thing to do. And then I saw this car come past me, you know, because I hadn't moved and, uh, and I was mesmerised and then the car just sandwiched in between the back of the car. And, Obviously, a few things happen and go through your mind when you witness that right next to you, like almost like where the cameras are. And obviously, the race was stopped instantly, and I just couldn't get out of the car. Um, because I thought if I get out of the car, I won't get back in. With Colin Chapman's sudden death, which shocked everybody, uh, how did the dynamic of the team change? When Colin died, the whole team died. Uh, I know I did. Um, I didn't just lose the team boss. I lost a fairy godfather because without Colin and Hazel and and the Chapman family. I'd never had the opportunity. You never know when your time's up, but it was very premature, very unexpected, and a big shock to the system. And so the whole dynamic of the team changed, and uh, for me, it was a big struggle from there on. So end of 1984, it was quite clear that your time at Lotus was, was coming to an end. Ayrton Senna was on the horizon uh, for Lotus. How was the Williams deal put together? We had a race at Zandvoort, uh, one of the last races at Zandvoort, and Frank and Patrick were sort of wavering, you know, what to do, what not to do. I think it was Sunday morning, I just sent a message via, I think it was Peter Windsor to Peter Collin saying, look, please tell Mr. Williams, I'm really flattered that he's considering me, but I'm off the market, I, I, I don't really wish to be considered anymore. You know, either we do a deal or we don't do a deal. I think that was the trigger that when the message got back to Frank, that I was off the market, then he wanted me even more than before. So uh, it, it sort of moved things forward at a pace then. You needed a win uh, as you got into the second half of that 85 season. Um, tell us about the, the Brands Hatch experience first of all. We had two problems. First problem was the turbo engines was like an on and off switch. So, you know, you went from no horsepower to six, seven hundred horsepower, like instantaneous, so you just get wheel spin. So we're, we're messing around with the rear suspension and sort of saying, look, you know, can we get a load more anti-squat or can we, whatever you do, do your magic, Patrick, because Patrick is fantastic. Mm. I mean, brilliant engineer. 
And anyway, Patrick came up with uh, some other ideas and we went testing and I did the test at Brands. And we found from changing you know, rear suspension and putting this rear suspension on exactly the same car, we found it was of a second a lap, which was huge. When you find intense, it's brilliant. But when you find almost a second and put it in your pocket, you know, you go, oh, this is good. This is really good. You know, it's like winning the flipping lottery. Yeah. And of course, it actually showed that we were incredibly competitive. And uh, obviously, we went on to win the race, which was sensational. And now he comes out of clearways and takes the chequered flag. And Nigel Mansell has won the Shell Oils Grand Prix of Europe. He is exuberant and he's got every justification to be. So into 1986, we're with huge optimism as a result of that. What a year it turned out to be. I mean, first of all, Nelson Piquet joins the team. Um, what was your initial feeling about that? Well, I've been, I've been a teammate to a world champion before with Keke, and we got on fantastically well. Uh, Nelson was a different kind of animal. He was more political. And uh, obviously stamped his authority or tried to on the team very significantly and was very friendly initially until he saw that I had a good turn of speed. In the midst of all that, Frank Williams had his accident. I think the first race he came back for, he was in the pit lane for, for Brands Hatch uh, for your win against Nelson, which must have been one of the most satisfying, I would think, of your career. And that was a race where there was a huge accident on the first corner with Jacques Lafitte, and my clutch exploded on the line. The spare car was set up for Nelson for the race, uh, which is a little bit different shape and size to me. But then we got into the race and we settled in, and uh, of course it was when we used to change gear properly. And I started to put pressure on Nelson about halfway through the race, and he missed a gear coming out one of the corners uh, onto the back straight, which gave me the momentum to just squeeze past, and I won the race. But there was one mistake in that race he made, and I made him pay for it. So into Adelaide, and, and, and I think a third place finish would have given you the world championship. Uh, I remember going down the main straight and um, no, not too far behind uh, Prost and just, just pulled out and I think uh, we were about 220 miles now and then the explosion happened at the back of the car with the tyre letting go, which rich, ri ripped the suspension and it ripped the brake line off and obviously we uh, then took all the might to actually keep the car facing the right direction so I didn't go straight into the wall. And obviously that was, that was that championship done, lost the championship by one point. But 87, uh, really the championship was on again uh, in theory, but I think Nelson's influence within the team became stronger uh, and showed itself in what sort of ways? Mischief you can deal with, um, all the things he said and did about my family and my children, uh, which then he had people he paid in the press to attack us personally. Uh, you can deal with that in a way because it's like sticks and stones isn't it? And, and that kind of thing. But he, he then started to pay certain people in the team and then he kept a lot of information quiet. And I think the turning point was basically at the British Grand Prix where obviously he went out uh, into the lead and I had a problem with my set of tyres and I came out with 20 something laps to go, 24 seconds behind. This was one of the most electrifying races yeah, of no, your career. Yeah, no, I, I broke the track record 11 times. Not once, 11 times. I hunted him down and hunted him down and the, the, the fans were just electrifying. It was just a sensation. Every corner is like a flipping a Mexican wave, you know, every time I came around. Tell us about the move which took you Well, past. I knew because, I, I mean, you know, I knew Nelson well by now. Uh, and I knew I'd have maybe one chance. I'd only have one chance. Nelson's a great driver. He's a great world champion. You know, he, to beat Nelson, you beat some of the best in the world. So coming onto the main straight, I did a real vain dummy to the right, no intention, but far enough back that I didn't have to back off. Then shoot straight, so the second dummy was on the left, and then sort of commit, but at a wide berth, so he really had to close me down and move. By which time, as soon as he committed and moved, and I knew he'd move then, at that instant, a switch back again, so I'll get the draft again, to then get the wheel in here before Stowe. And that was it. And you can see on the pictures he came, and we touched at 200 miles an hour going into that corner. And, but he was screwed then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was still sort of between the two of you as, as the season reached a climax, but then you had that accident in qualifying in, in Japan. 
Yeah, I've, I've, I've replayed that over. You can just see the, the offside rear wheel just go off a little bit. You can see a puff of sand come up. It just lost a little grip for whatever reason. It swapped ends, went up in the air, hit the barriers. And so when it came down, I had uh, like something like 76 G up the spine and it crushed uh, some vertebrae in the lower part of my spine. And you know, literally when that happened, it just paralyzes you and the pain you're in is just unbelievable. Meantime, Nelson had left with the engines and you had Judd power for 1988 and that was a, a washout season. So Ferrari... Had two seconds. <laughs> well, <yeah. laughs> Ferrari, though, was on the horizon. When did you first meet Enzo Ferrari? Um, it was back in the mid-80s mid uh, when I had a chat with him. Um, we didn't put anything together at that time. Um, but then uh, basically uh, made approaches again in 87. And then in 88, circumstances, because the first time we ever got an outright number one contract was for 88. For me as their outright number one driver, it was really quite painful yeah. to be then the number one driver knowing you're going into a season of 88, thinking that you can be world champion, but then knowing that you haven't got the package to do it overnight. Enzo approached me very strongly again and said, you know, would I come and join Ferrari? And made me an offer which uh, was, uh, was very interesting. And uh, so we got it together and I left Williams to go for Ferrari. After the break, the move from Williams to Ferrari, as Nigel becomes a hero of the Italian fans. Williams had gotten close to the world title, but after a frustrating 1988 season, the future for Nigel Mansell in 89 was Ferrari. Had it been a sort of motor racing ambition, what well, it is for everyone to, to drive yeah, for It's Ferrari. very romantic, I mean, because, you know, I had no idea where my career was going to end up at this point in time. Everyone started to realise that I could be a, a, an extraordinary number one driver. But, um, but there was lots of other great number one drivers, which were all world champions at the time. And Enzo gave me an opportunity, which was amazing. Uh, the, uh, they were gone, they'd gone through very difficult times, Ferrari, and uh, John Barnard was working very hard there. And anyway, we, we did some incredible winter testing, but the car was incredibly unreliable. Sadly, again, um, Enzo um, departed. And it was a very difficult time for the team, but um, going out and winning that first race was sensational. So 1989 was a trying year, but there was one distinct highlight, great battle between yourself and Ayrton Senna in, in Hungary. I'd made an absolutely brilliant start, and I overtook seven before I got into the first corner. And then I was hunting down Ayrton, which was very difficult, because it's just a few tenths a lap, and it's a give and take. And, and so I could see in the distance the money train of Stefan Johansson coming up. And I put a spurt on this. I thought, just maybe, maybe it might just catch him at the wrong time, which then might give me an opportunity. And anyway, it couldn't have worked out better because we caught him. Ayrton could see me coming and I was going backwards and forwards. So I knew I got his attention because he was keeping an eye on me. And one of the rare moments Ayrton made a mistake, he chose the wrong side a money tram. And then Stefan obviously saw me and sort of hesitated what he was doing, but just boxed Ayrton in just for a split second. And I was fast enough just to go bang there and commit going into the fast kink. And I boxed him in, he had nowhere to go. But it gave the team huge optimism for, for 1990 and justifiably so. At what point did you learn that Alain Pross was coming aboard for 1990? It, it, it was very late because, um, you know, I had an outright number one contract for 1990 and then Ferrari deemed that uh, they wanted a current world champion to join the team. And so Alan did come to the team as outright number one and I was there as number two. But then as Alan found out that, um, you know, just because I was number two didn't mean I couldn't beat him. So we had a very interesting year and uh, it was very difficult at times. I didn't want to be with some of these people who are not genuine sportsmen. And so that's cool, that's fine, you have a choice. And so I retired and was really comfortable from that. But then the phone rings from Frank Williams and uh, the approach comes and didn't start too well, but by the midpoint uh, it really picked up and there was another fantastic British Grand Prix for you. 
Yeah, no, I mean, it was it was truly uh, amazing, really, because, um, again, technology had moved up. We had what is known then as a semi-automatic gearbox where it would just change up. Um, but then the reliability problems was huge. Um, we were very slow getting off the blocks with the car and setting it up and, and getting the reliability there. So, as you said, it wasn't until sort of midway through the season it started to come good. I did close the gap on the championship to eight points uh, to Ayrton. Had a fantastic uh, Grand Prix in, in 91, obviously, winning the British again. Um, there was but, that iconic image of you giving Ayrton the lift back to the, yeah, to the pits, no, which was a, it was a great moment in the sport, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it, it was a good moment because, you know, I think it's great to demonstrate that, you know, in different sports there's still humility and, and understanding. and and. The crowd, because I'd been given a hard time at many races in his country, I could see the crowd were giving him a bit of a hard time and that. And, and I thought, well, you know, it won't hurt to give him a lift back. And, um, you know, I did have thoughts, well, if I get up to 140, it might fall off. <laughs> <laughs> at that moment in Barcelona, what happened down the straight there sort of summed up the relationship between the two of you. What do you remember of your own thought process there? Because you knew he, won't, he, he wasn't going to give any ground. Well, well, it's the worst type of brinkmanship with yeah. a loaded gun. You've both got loaded guns and they're both pointing at you. You know, who's going to pull the trigger first? You know, who's going to blink? You know, and it's, you know... It's just like that, and you know. But what you do is you look yourself in the mirror and say, uh, "How much are you going to put it on the line today?" You know, not a lot of people put it on the line 100%, but we did. We both did, but we both knew that. We well, eventually knew it, and that's why it was such a fantastic moment. It was a defining moment in our sporting careers between one another. Mm. 1992, your World Championship year. Um, I mean, another great image of you and Ayrton was at Monaco that year when you had to go into the pits and came out and sat on his gearbox for about the yeah. last ten laps, which was fantastic. Did you ever have a chance of getting past there? No chance. I mean, Ayrton's too, too accomplished driver. I mean, look at how the rules have changed now. I mean, if Ayrton, if anyone drives like Ayrton did then in 92, he'd have had two stop-go penalties in the pits for blocking. Yeah. Um, you know, how things change again. Um, but it was sensational, um, obviously very disappointing not to have won the race. But it showed, I think, a better skill than we see today in some ways. Monaco, incredible, two, if you like, gladiators, racing cars like there's no tomorrow. We didn't touch. These two are the implacable rivals in Formula One. And you can see for yourselves what the situation is now as Mansell swarmed around all over the McLaren. You know, we got so close and he squeezed, he actually blocked, he did everything. We didn't touch, we didn't have any pieces of bodywork come off. Um, we weren't slowing down. Uh, it was hell to leather for, you know, those number of laps. What a season. The records tumbled, the race wins, the pole positions and so on. Um, and another great British Grand Prix as well. Yeah, the, the, the British Grand Prix was, was an amazing weekend. And, I mean, it was just like... You know, the most legal drug you can have in the world is adrenaline. And, and Silverstone for me and the British Grand Prix, no matter where it is, I mean, it's just, you know, I feel like I own it. So the feeling on, on the podium in Hungary, you, you, you won the title in August, uh, but what was that feeling like? Ah, best feeling in the world. I mean, and, and what Ayrton said to me and, you know, virtually uh, uh, had his arm around me, we were hugging, and, and then he said some incredible words in my ear. And, and made me realise, you know, why he was the type of person he was. He explained to me why he was. He, he felt that he had to say something to me to explain why he was such um, a difficult person at times. And I just looked at him and embraced it. Because he knew just, this was the best feeling in the world. Yeah, he just said, absolutely right. It's a very select private club. So off you go to IndyCar and to go out there and win the title, back to back with the Formula One World Championship. I mean, that was making a statement almost as powerful as successfully defending the title. Yeah, no, it's extraordinary because, I mean, you know, Paul Newman, I mean, what a legend in his lifetime. I know, sadly, Paul's departed now, but, you know, he said to me, look, come to America and have an adventure. You know, he said, I promise you it'll be adventure, it'll be fun. And IndyCar at that time was, you know, right at probably the height of its... Uh, uh, racing ability and of course we went over there and it was so different I mean going to some of the racetracks you like out in the Wild West in Phoenix 
and uh, yeah it was an extraordinary experience and I have to say when I went over there and I drove the car for the first time I was going oh dear this is not what I expected but it was a challenge and it was fun and everybody embraced it and wanted you there for the right reasons so there wasn't any hassle and we had been living in America for a couple of years then as well so we were very well settled so uh, we just got on to do the job. And inevitably, being yourself, there was a big crash early on. You were nursing an injury right the way through, through that year. Yeah, absolutely right. I backed it into the concrete ward about 220, 228 miles an hour, punched a hole in a three foot thick concrete wall. The shock wave went through the gearbox and into my back and obviously did quite severe damage to my back and uh, cumulating in 148 stitches to sew my back back up and taking a 14 inch by 12 inch section away. But you made your point in terms of the championship and then circumstances brought you back uh, to Formula One for the back end of uh, 94. the 94 season. And then you win the last race of the season um, in Australia, which is obviously remembered for other things, the coming together of Damon Hill and, and Michael Schumacher. What did you make of the incident? I thought it was a great shame. One can argue and say what Michael did was, you know, uh, unprofessional or a racing incident. I would like to give him the benefit of the doubt and say the whole thing was a racing incident. I think, I think uh, Damon, if you speak to him now, could have been wiser. And I think if you speak to Michael, that perhaps he could have done something different. But they were racing for the World Championship. It was the last race. It was down to the wire. You know, I had a perfect stadium seat with everything. And, um, you know, it was, um, it was interesting to watch it all unfold. Life now, you're cycling uh, and a lot of charity stuff as well. Yeah, the, 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 the fantastic thing now, which um, really for a long, long time has been the charity work and UK youth is so dear to our heart. The, the biggest thing is, is, is giving the hopes and dreams of children that they can still, you know, have their aspirations and dreams that they might one day come to and give them a better self-esteem, but most important, give them education. Education that they can make better life choices. And um, we all know to incarcerate somebody uh, costs about 148,000 pounds for the government a year. To educate somebody is only about nine to 12,000 pounds a year. So you work the numbers, let's educate them, let's empower them to make better decisions. Because you give them the information, they'll make better decisions. And being positive for youth is positive about life. Well, keep up that fantastic work, and uh, thanks very much for talking to yeah, us today. pleasure. Some great races. <laughs> He's fainted. Mansell finishes. Nigel Mansell becomes world champion of 1992.